Welcome everyone to today's webinar titled Advanced Self-Powered Systems of Integrated Sensors and Technologies. That's actually the acronym Vena for your center. And I'm pleased to introduce you and welcome you to the webinar today. Vina, you're a, a professor at North Carolina State University. And uh, is your technical background uh, electrical or nanotechnology or semiconductors? I know you're, there's a Motorola in there somewhere. Yes, all of, all of the above. <laughs> Could you, uh, your, your voice microphone sounds slightly different. Can you make sure that, uh, slightly low, can you make sure that it's, um, you've got good directionality on your microphone? Yes, so can you hear me now? Yes, that sounds good. Right. So welcome here. And also, uh, you're the director, as it says here, of this uh, engineering research center at North Carolina State titled ACES. And I know you're going to be talking about that more today. So why don't you just go ahead and take us into your presentation? Great. Thanks very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be talking to everyone today. I'm going to give you an overview uh, of the kinds of work that we're carrying out in the ASSIST uh, Center. This is an engineering research center uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, I'm at NC State, and NC State is the lead university, but we're partnering very closely with um, um, some very critical um, uh, partners, uh, such as University of Virginia, Penn State University, Florida International University, uh, University of uh, North Car uh, Carolina at Chapel Hill, University of Michigan, and recently, we've added more partners at University of Utah and University of Notre Dame. So we are spreading across the country with uh, the mission that we are carrying out. So um, as, the, as uh, was mentioned in the introduction, the goal here is to get a good overview and understand the challenges and barriers that face wearable devices. And so to begin this discussion, the first uh, question that we wanted to poll everybody on is uh, whether or not you own a wearable device. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Michael, for, to run the poll. Thank you, Vina. So folks, just so we're on the same page, the terms wearable technology, wearable devices, and wearables, they're used interchangeably. But all of them refer to electronic technologies or devices like computers or microprocessors that are incorporated into items of clothing and accessories like watches and so on which can be comfortably worn. So I'm going to launch the poll here. And I'm, you'll see it right on your screen. So this is a live poll, Vina. You'll see their, their responses, too. People are typing yes, no. Um, and we're giving them a chance to respond. So folks, take another few seconds. You probably know if you currently own a wearable device or not. Hopefully, Vina, yeah. right now, the no's are leading. Oh, that's interesting. Very Pretty interesting. interesting. Okay, let's, let's uh, everyone, as far as I can tell, has recorded, and we're leveling out at about a two-to-one response. Two, for every two people not owning a wearable, one does. Pretty interesting. I'm going to close this poll now. All right, that's very interesting, and, and I'd like to get into some of the reasons why, perhaps, as we go through these uh, the slides, why uh, the folks that don't have a wearable, maybe why they're not using one. Perhaps sure. it's the hassle, perhaps it's the lack of value. All right, great. Right. So that was an interesting result. Um, we have another poll for you, and this is brought, limited now perhaps to um, uh, the folks that do have a wearable, or maybe if you don't have a wearable and you would like to get one, what would you like to use it for? So let's open up this poll. Here are some options that, um, that are created for you. So um, you can use the chat box folks if you if you would like to say what you might have here just go ahead and type uh, other in the question box it says question box but I mean chat box so let's see what they say a lot of results coming in oh they're all over the place Vina this is good but notice I, the I, leading I, the leading category is health there yes you're setting me up nicely for the talk <laughs> Oh, we have one person in the chat window that uh, has a fashion accessory that they've purchased as well. Oh, interesting. Very good. OK, All so right. the leading one is health, followed by fitness. That's not too surprising, is it? That's not surprising. And I would say the majority of devices today, and I'll show you this in a couple of minutes, are, are geared towards uh, fitness 
Um, and so I'm, I'm glad to see that there's a lot of interest in health. All right, so let's do one more. And um, that one is really getting to some of the technical challenges that, uh, that today's wearable devices face. And this question is, if you have a wearable device, how long have you been using it for? I have to admit, Veen, I added a response there. I want to get a wearable device. Right, good one. So we had an option there. <laughs> oh, that's actually most of our folks want to get a wearable device, so that's good. Yes, so interest is high. All right, should we wait for a few more minutes, seconds here? No, let me go ahead and close this poll. I think we've got the idea of our audience, right? They're, they're very interested, and yet uh, only a fraction of them currently have a wearable. Right, and, and a lot of them have not been using it for a while, for, for very long. So, OK, All go right, ahead. Wait. So let me jump in. So, th so this is perhaps a snapshot of the wearable space that we have today. We have lots of different devices. Lots of uh, vendors are in the market uh, for wearables, lots of price ranges. But in general, um, uh, when it comes to health applications, which seems to be the highest interest level here, uh, these wearable devices, unfortunately, do not provide, most of them do not provide uh, uh, the, the, um, the, the function uh, for health monitoring. And as to why that is, we can discuss at length, but there are three things that bubble up to the top. Uh, the first is that most of these wearable devices have very high power consumption, and so charging and recharging becomes a rather uh, strenuous and, and mundane activity, which uh, gets people disinterested in the, in, in the wearable. Another important limitation of today's wearable devices are, are basically of the limited functionality. So maybe they're monitoring your steps for you, but uh, maybe not much more than that. And so having the ability to monitor a variety of different uh, signals on, let's say, for health, it'll be on the body, is, is essential to making these effective for health. And uh, the third one, which is a, a huge one, is the data and the inaccuracy in the data. Whether it's your sleep data or whether it's your activity data, they're basically, um, today's devices suffer from inaccuracies. And all of these three issues put together basically um, uh, make this current wearable space not very effective in addressing the health applications out there. So in order for us to understand what's needed for health applications, let's look at the landscape of what we are dealing with when it comes to health challenges that we face. And this slide is uh, something that the entire world faces. Uh, I have some metrics coming up that are based on America, uh, US statistics, but this uh, general problem is true all over the world. So. Um, in order to really get an idea of what we're dealing with, let's look at some of the numbers. So in the U.S., uh, as an example, healthcare costs are currently about 17% of the GDP, and this is $4 trillion. Uh, it's quite a lot of money. And it uh, turns out that most of these uh, uh, costs are connected to chronic conditions. I'm talking about heart disease, asthma, um, diabetes, uh, autoimmune diseases, and things of that nature that consume most of these costs. And uh, another sobering uh, statistic is that one in three Americans actually suffer from multiple chronic conditions. So you can see how the problem can get a lot worse. On average, we visit our doctors about four times a year. That leaves behind large gaps in the year where we are not getting monitored for our health. And another factor that I'd like to uh, mention here is that in addition to our health and chronic conditions, the role of environment is also something very important to understand, <clears throat> especially when it comes to things like lung disease, uh, respiratory conditions. And according to the American Lung Association, one in four Americans are currently living in air quality criteria that are below the, the specifications from EPA. So when, all, when you put all these things together, you realize what a massive problem we have. And there are many solutions from many different directions that are needed to really address this healthcare. Technology is certainly one of those solutions and a very important solution, but it has to be the right type of technology to be able to get us there. So our vision in, in, this, uh, in this center is to use nanotechnology to uh, really enable this solution to, to this healthcare problem and help us from going 
uh, from managing illness, which is the current state of what's being done, to managing wellness. And, ex and that's a very big statement. So let me boil it down to some, some tangible items here. And the way we want to achieve this vision is by building self-powered, wearable, wireless, multi-sensor platforms. And those are some really key words here, which I'll get into more detail in my talk. And it's really the combination of these features that we believe can enable long-term monitoring, because if you have self-powered devices, they don't need to be charged anymore, so they can run perpetually, which leads to long-term monitoring of personal health and personal environment, like I mentioned earlier about the connection with environment and respiratory diseases as one example. Another uh, uh, aspect of this is by having multiple sensors on our wearable platform, we can really start correlating different sensor data and understanding the effect of one health signal on another health signal and get a much more sophisticated picture of what's going on in our bodies. And finally, this will also incre in increase user compliance, going back again to the self-powered feature. If you don't have to worry about charging the wearable device, then the users are likely to keep wearing it and not leave it somewhere in their house when they go to work or they forget about it and they, and they don't bother coming back. So the compliance is a big part of, of this equation as well. All right, so let's get into some of the, the details of this. And um, basically, what we are trying to do is to build these devices that, that are always on, we want to make sure we are following this one equation, which is that the power that we generate from the, you, the, the human being itself, or from any source in that matter, uh, has to be greater than the power that we consume in the wearable device. And in our case, the power that we generate is coming from the human body itself in the form of body heat and body motion, and I'll talk about this and show you how this works. And in the case of power consumption, this is actually happening with all the electronics in the, in the wearable device, the, the radios, which are used to transmit the information from the wearable to your smartphone or to some other place, and also all of your sensors, your health sensors, they all consume power. So anything that we build should follow this equation, and if we can satisfy this equation, we can get an always-on self-powered device. And let's not forget that we are dealing with humans, so it's not just enough to come up with some great engineering techniques to achieve always-on operation. We need to make sure that these are aesthetically pleasing, they're comfortable, that people will actually wear them, they are um, providing meaningful information to the user. The data that comes back to the user should be in a digestible form, should, be allow, should enable the user to, to really take action and change their, let's say, their lifestyle um, habits if, if necessary. So these are all the various components that go into uh, building this self-powered, uh, always-on device. All right, so let's get into some of the details uh, of what's involved here. So, as I mentioned to you, we are really uh, sat, uh, looking at the, at the power, power problem from both sides. We're looking at the supply of power, and we're looking at the demand of power. In the supply side, I mentioned energy harvesting from body heat and body motion. We also want to store it in supercapacitors, not batteries, because batteries have limit, limited number of uh, charging cycles, and then they die. But supercapacitors can last much longer. And so we want to look at that aspect. And on the other side, for the demand side, we're looking at uh, the, the computation element. What do you do with the set sensor data coming in? How do you analyze it? How do you communicate it, the radios? How do you build ultra-low power health and environmental sensors? And how do you manage all this power that's flowing through the system in a very efficient manner? And the bottom of the scale is where our, our humans come in, the wearability, the data, and the reliability. So that's the, it was, it's based, this slide is, uh, uh, same message as the previous slide, but giving a little bit more detail. All right, so for, um, yeah, so there's a, there's a question that came in, and it's an excellent question. Are any wearables passively powered, like some RFID applications? And yes, there are. You can, uh, I'm, not sh I'm not aware of any wearables on the market currently that are powered that way, but definitely you can uh, power devices uh, passively, like you do RFID tags in grocery stores, for example, or in other places. 
Um, and that is certainly something that can be done. Our goal in our work here is to look at autonomous sources of power. So the user doesn't have to do anything intentionally to make the device uh, uh, powered up. So the, power, the device is always going to be autonomous, autonomously working. And so we are focused on, on those sources of power, but these other sources are also, are also possible, and, and that's a great question. Um, all right, so let me get into this, this uh, block diagram, and, and some of you may be familiar with block diagrams. Basically what we have is, and I'll use my arrow button here, uh, what we have is our wearable node, which is shown on the left here. This wearable node has some key features. For example, you've got to give it some power. In a traditional wearable device, this power is a battery. But in our case, this is our human body power. We have to connect it to different kinds of sensors, whether it's health sensors like your uh, heart rate or your ox blood oxygen levels, environmental sensors like ozone, and ozone levels in the environment, or even particulate matter in, uh, that's generated from automobiles. That's another environmental toxin. Um, we want to store any of the power that's generated into supercapacitors, and that's up here. We want to be able to connect it and send the data to a, a different location using antenna. And this is our core chip here in the middle, which has all your processing units, your analog front end for your sensors, your power management circuitry, and your built-in radio chip as well. So this is really a very, very low power uh, system on chip that, uh, that we are developing in the SIS Center, along with developing these other blocks that I've shown you. Once you have the wearable device, we, can't, we don't want to connect any wires to it, so we want to send the data wirelessly to our smartphone. And you can see the kinds of things that happen on the smartphone. The data is received. We have to write software to be able to visualize the data. We also may have to come up with new algorithms to make sense of what the ECG is actually telling us, electrocardiogram is telling us. If a patient has arrhythmia, we want to be able to look at that data and detect if arrhythmia has happened in real time. So this is a very important piece of, of the equation. But it doesn't end there. Once we have the data on the phone, we also want to send it to the cloud. And this is where uh, big data comes in, uh, where we can have uh, data from not just one person, but lots of uh, people. So this becomes population health in some ways. But also it allows us to connect our data to our doctors. And with their uh, infrastructures in place, they can also look at our data and help us understand um, what health issues might be going on. So this all is part of the equation for really taking wearables into the health space. All right, so let me go back to my main equation that I had shown you earlier. The power generation has to be greater than power consumption. And let's talk about power generation now. So you may be wondering, let me go back to the previous slide, you may be wondering, well, how do you generate power from the human body? And I've already mentioned to you two key, key ways to do it. One is body heat and one is body motion. And in the area of body heat, there's a very interesting phenomena that happens. That right now, probably where you are, if it's uh, an air-conditioned room, for example, your skin is at, at a particular temperature. In Fahrenheit, you're talking about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, the room temperature is maybe around 72 degrees or 73 degrees Fahrenheit. And that leaves about a 25 degrees Fahrenheit difference between your skin and the environment that you're sitting in. We can actually capture that temperature difference and convert it to usable power using materials called thermoelectric materials and thermoelectric devices. And that's exactly what I'm showing you in this slide here, where we can see we have built flexible thermoelectric devices, which consist of thermoelectric materials. These are materials, for example, called, that are known as bismuth telluride. Um, and uh, silicon germanium is another thermoelectric material if it's doped properly. But bismuth telluride is, is one of the best ones for applications that are, that are related to the temperature of human beings. We can put these materials either in this form factor or some, and, and some of our most, most recent work is extremely flexible. You can wrap it around your wrist or you wrap it around your arm. They're flexible, they're stretchable, and some of our latest prototypes we're building, these materials can even be breathable. But you can see how by putting these materials on your body, you can now start taking that temperature difference and converting it to a voltage. 
And I would like to show you a video uh, as an illustration uh, of how this actually works. So this student, is his name is Amin. He's a student in the ASSIST Center. And he has put together a thermoelectric device that can be placed on the skin and generates usable power. And so, so I think, Michael, I'll have to turn it over to you for the video. Yes, I'm ready to show it, Veena. And just one second, I'll launch the video here. This one's a short one. Here we go. All right, so there's no audio in the video, so you'll just hear me. This is a wearable, uh, flexible armband that has been designed using our thermoelectrics. And as soon as it's placed on the arm, you can see the LED lights up very brightly. Uh, this is a power-hungry LED, and so we are creating enough power from this band to power up that LED. And as soon as the armband is taken off, the LED also turns off. So the advances that we are making in the center right now can light up not only just that one LED, but multiple LEDs. But more importantly, it can light up our health, uh, it, can, it can power up our health sensors. So for those of you who are interested in numbers to see how we compare to state of the art, let me go to the next slide, where I'm showing you what's, what's available in the market and what our technologies are able to do. So COTS stands for commercial off the shelf, and ASSIST is our own materials here, thermoelectric materials here. And without getting into the details of all the numbers, I want to point out this number down on, down on the bottom right here, uh, sorry, the bottom left, where we can see that our thermoelectric devices, when, uh, when uh, they have airflow on top of them, can generate uh, 156 microwatts per centimeter squared. And uh, compare that to a commercial device, and that's only 35 microwatts per centimeter squared. So we're getting quite a bit of enhancement using our nanotechnology-based thermoelectric materials. Now, what can you do with 156 microwatts? Well, it turns out that you can do a lot with that. But you can also put together 10 of these thermoelectric devices together, get an, uh, around an armband, and now you're talking about easily over a milliwatt of power. And milliwatt of power is certainly enough to do multiple health sensors. And I'll talk about that as well. All right, so I'd like to pause here for a minute and give everybody a chance to see if they have any burning questions on the energy harvesting piece. I didn't talk about the, the motion harvesting because we have so much to talk about today, but we can also capture motion of the wrist, motion of the foot, and capture that into usable power as well. You know, Vina, that is one of the questions that came in through the email channel. It's that kinetic energy of motion. Uh, I mean, it's funny, but I suppose, in a way, the wind-up Swiss watch is a way of converting or storing kinetic energy or using kinetic energy. Has anyone come up with a, would it be too, what's the right word here? Could you have a device that had a, a wind-up to it? I guess you would really like to have no human uh, interaction at all to provide the power. Yeah, we certainly the, the, uh, the, the self-winding watches are a great example of what's possible. And, um, and, but what we really want to do is take the user out of the equation. And so if somebody is, is simply turning their hands or talking with their hands, which some of us like to do, we want to be able to use that and, and part of that power and convert it to stored energy. And we have come up with these what are called non-resonant mechanical harvesters, which are eccentric-based motion harvesters. So you move your wrist in different directions, and all of that power is being captured. Um, our latest prototypes have shown us that we can capture about 42 microwatts of power uh, just by just by a simple walking motion. Um, and so that's you know, not, not as high as the thermoelectrics that I just showed you in the previous slide. But uh, still, it can provi provide us a backup source of power and keep charging up that supercapacitor. Even when we don't need it right away, it provides that extra source of power. So that's, that's the non-mechanical, low-range motion of power. Of course, if you hit your foot on the, on the road with a, with a great force, that's going to generate a lot of power as well. And the Nike brands and others have been looking at that as well. So definitely motion is, is, a, is a very strong contender here. 
One question that came in from our colleague at Penn State is, uh, what's your goal? You mentioned you you can get a milliwatt thermally and, and maybe 40 microwatts by some of your other things. What's your goal? What, what, would, what would be the holy grail? Yeah, a very good question. We often talk about this ourselves and our team. Uh, I think we want to be able to get a milliwatt of power for, for, the, for the wearable application, for an armband or the wristband. Definitely want to be able to get a milliwatt. Uh, because we want to look at not one sensor, but maybe six different sensors on that wearable platform. But uh, there's another opportunity here, and that's the area of textiles. If you can increase the area that you're covering the body and use more area to harvest, now you can get into milliwatts, maybe 10 milliwatts of power, which can al allow us to do things that are just not possible under a milliwatt. So it's not, we don't have a specific goal. I think it changes as we grow as technologies become more and more mature. Um, but I think for the, for the wearable space, when, I'm, and I, when I mean wearable, I'm particularly talking about discrete bands and watches sure. uh, or chest patches that you can put on. For that, we want a milliwatt of power. You know, one of our uh, participants asks about the uh, temperature range. And obviously, right, the, if you had a bigger temperature differential, right, that would help you from this thermal, thermal conversion. But basically, these are not exactly designed for high temperature, I mean, beyond 40 degrees C sort of temperature work, right? That is correct. And I think maybe the, the uh, participant is, is thinking about some higher temperature harvesting applications which are also very useful and suitable for thermoelectrics. For those applications, uh, you would use a different type of thermoelectric material that is more efficient at the higher temperatures. For our temperatures, these are really designed to work exactly what you said around, um, around 37, 40 degrees sure. Celsius. Sure, sure. One last question, it's a technical one. The data that you showed, is it per degree uh, delta T or was that over some defined temperature delta? Do you see the question there? Uh, I'm not exactly sure what values we're referring to. Yes, per degree delta T. Okay, that makes sense. Yes. Good. Thank you for that. Uh, take us forward. There'll, there'll be two more opportunities for questions, and thanks, Fina. All right. Let me move on. Uh, so the next aspect of what I would like to cover is the consumption side. So this is also very important, and we, you cannot just work on one side of the problem here. And so on the consumption side, there are many things or many components of the wearable platform that consume power, and our goal is to minimize the power consumption across the board. The first place where a lot of power is being consumed is in the, in the chip. And the, low, the, the processor part of it, the CPU, if you will, is really not a huge hog of power, but the radios can be a very big consumption, a consumer of power. So we have to work on ultra-low power radios. Uh, any kind of sensors that we develop, and in our case, we're looking at electrocardiograms, we're looking at um, microphones for lung sounds because our in we have significant uh, uh, interest in asthma, and we want to look at whether we can detect wheezing from microphones before the user has any, any labored breath. We want to be able to do that at very low power. We want to look at blood oxygen levels. Um, again, low power, hydration, activity, ozone monitoring. So these are some examples of the kinds of sensors that if you buy on the market today, they're going to be very high in power consumption. And so research and development needs to happen to make these really low power. So let me give you some examples of, of what our team has demonstrated. Um, and so here is work from uh, University of Virginia. They're part of the Assist Center. And they have designed a, a chip that is a that's uh, uh, a standard CMOS chip, but it's designed to work under what's called sub-threshold operation. And for those of you who understand that, that's great. Um, and those of you who are outside the field, it's basically uh, a way to operate the device at very low power um, uh, and, and, and to really uh, allow us to fulfill this equation that I've been talking about. So uh, with, the, with this chip in place, our team uh, has demonstrated that they can harvest a full ECG spectrum, electrocardio spectrum, uh, for, <clears throat> uh, and remotely send it through the radio with the new radios that we have, consuming less than 20 microwatts of power. And so I'd like to um, 
show you that this is uh, the power consumption of this full-fledged ECG signal that's coming from the body and being wirelessly transmitted to a base station such as a smartphone. And so this is a very enabling technology or, or a very enabling platform. Of course, our goal is to not just do ECG, but do all these other sensors that I mentioned. So uh, let me talk about that. But before I get into that, there's one other piece I'd like to spend just one minute on, which is the radio. And as, as many of you probably stream radio music in your car from your phone to your car uh, speaker system, or you have your wearable connected to your phone using a Bluetooth uh, radio. Bluetooth radios are, are, are ubiquitous and allow us to really uh, work in this wireless space. But Bluetooth radios consume a lot of power. And the power levels are much higher than what we can provide with our energy harvesting from the body approaches that I have, that I have talked about. And so in the Assist Center, we have been developing uh, different kinds of radios. These are based on different uh, frequency ranges of, of radio transmission. Um, these, for example, we have an ultra-wideband transmission radio. We have a, a W-band compliant receiving. These are some technical terms for radios that if you follow the radio space, you might be able to understand. But if you are, again, outside the space, I would like you to focus on this plot here, which shows the power consumed by the radio on the y-axis and the sensitivity of the radio on the x-axis. The sensitivity is another uh, way to describe the range of the radio, how far you want the radio to be, able to, to, to be able to receive the data or send the data. And so as you can probably guess, the, the Bluetooth radios <coughs> and, the, and the, the more left you go on this plot, the longer the range. So the Bluetooth radios have a very long range, several meters, 30 meters in some cases, but they also have extremely high power consumption, and it's not even on the plot. It's really off the chart. Uh, if you talk about the wearable space, it turns out that you don't have to communicate that far. Usually your phone will be in a within a couple of meters of your wearable device. So you can go back a little bit on the range and perhaps you know, be okay with, a, with one or two meters of range. But with some additional circuitry and looking at different spectrum of the electromagnetic uh, uh, radio uh, signals, we can reduce our power levels to very low values somewhere down here. So these new radios allow us to reduce the power consumption. Of course, it comes at the cost of range, which we can, which we can handle. Uh, and these are some of the numbers that are associated with radios. The reason I've dedicated a slide to this is because radios, uh, in, in, for the most part, are the biggest consumer uh, of power in a, in a wearable platform. All right, so now that we've talked about the chip and the radio, let me talk about some of the sensors. And so um, uh, this is another area where uh, some engineering has to happen to reduce the power levels. So metal oxide sensors are available on the market. They are a very uh, nice sensor technology that can be used to sense different gases in the environment, whether it's ozone, carbon monoxide, and even some volatile organic compounds. Uh, but the problem with the ones in the market are they consumed hundreds of milliwatts of power because these metal oxide films typically have to be heated up. And, um, and, and so in our center, we have come up with a very innovative material, uh, innovative way of, of uh, handling the metal oxide material so that it doesn't have to be heated up. And because we can skip that heating step, which is, as you might suspect, is a very power-hungry step, our power levels drop dramatically. And in our gas sensor at work, we are now within 100 microwatts of a, of a sensing measurement that would typically take 50 milliwatts using a commercial sensor. Uh, in, in addition to looking at things like ozone and nitrous uh, uh, carbon monoxide and other gases in the environment, volatile organic compounds are also of interest to us. These are coming uh, about in many environments that we are working in, maybe in a hospital setting, there are lots of volatile organic compounds, maybe in an industrial setting, maybe even in your homes. Uh, again, um, commercial uh, VOC sensors are very power hungry, and um, um, uh, the ones that we have built here using MEMS technologies, we can bring the power levels down below 77, um, below 100 microwatts, uh, allowing us to be compatible with the power that we generate from the body. And, and one more example I'd like to give you is, actually a couple more examples I'd like to give you before I pause again, 
is we're also looking at flexible and stretchable materials as well to place on the skin. Here's an example of a silver, nano, silver nanowire material that's been incorporated into a PDMS polymer, and this polymer can then be placed uh, around curved parts of the body. It provides very good electrical conductivity, and it also is sensitive to pressure. And so with this one material, we can get electrical measurements, we can get mechanical measurements, and those two measurements allow us to get a lot of flexibility. So in this picture here, I'm showing you a multimodal sensing uh, array where uh, the, uh, this one area of the sensor array allows us to do ECG measurements, hydration measurements, pressure and strain measurements without using a lot of real estate. So this is smart design of, 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 the, of the area available to really maximize the amount of sensors we can, we can extract or data that we can extract. And I, I would also like to emphasize that in addition to looking at physiological measurements such as ECG and, and activity monitoring and optical measurements like uh, blood oxygen levels and uh, photoplasmithograms, these are all different kinds of sensor technologies we're working on, we are also very interested in biochemical measurements. And this is really getting a lot of attention in the, in the literature in the last several months. And, uh, and, and the key here is to do it in a non-invasive manner. Anybody can you, can, you can go to the doctor's office and do a blood prick and understand what your glucose levels are or what your different hormone levels are. But imagine a scenario where you can get long-term data of your glucose levels just by looking at your sweat. And so we are building these breathable patches that you can place on the skin. This is what they look like. You can see the, the scale here is five microns. Within this space here, you see lots of small fibers Nanocellulose is plant-derived material. It's biocompatible. It can be placed on the skin and, and be placed there for long periods of time. It's breathable, absorbs the sweat. And then if you functionalize this, and this is what the material looks like on a large scale. So this is now a five millimeter bar. It looks basically like a transparent uh, sheet. And you can functionalize it with the right electrodes and start measuring different biomarkers that are in sweat. And this is a, a really the next step for sensing technologies is to get into this biochemical space, but do it in a non-invasive manner. All right, so I've given you a few examples of the, of the kinds of things we are doing to lower the power consumption, not only of our uh, chip and radio, but also of a variety of our different sensors. So I'd like to, again, pause now and address any questions that you may have. We do have a couple of questions, Veena. What is clock harvesting? Uh, that refers to some of the, um, the this is, I, I'm assuming this is connected to the chip one that I showed yes. earlier. Right, right. One second. I can go back here? Uh, sure, go back. I think it was on the bottom of that previous one. Oh no, that's energy harvesting. Hmm. Um, I can't remember where that is. Oh, well, let's yeah, not worry about the, that. On the radio box, but, yeah. Yeah, we can always come back to that one. Yeah, we, we, it, it's one of those technical approaches in, in terms of yeah. um, reducing the power level of the radio transmission. Here's an interesting other question. It's sort of an observation as much as a question. If you run out of radio range, um, what about using, say, a, a local connection to your cell phone and then having the cell going, going out and making the connection? Yes. In fact, I want to make sure that I clarify this point. I believe this is going to be the main mode of operation. You would always want to go from your wearable device to your phone to ensure that the connect, that yes. connection is solid. And then from the phone, you can go anywhere else, to the cloud or you know, so on and so forth. In an ideal scenario, it'll be nice if you can go from the wearable directly to the cloud. But yeah. uh, that takes a lot of power. And as the, sure. as the participant has identified, it, it, there's a range problem there. So uh, I think we want to make sure that we can get to the phone. That's a shorter range. And then from there onwards, uh, we have a lot more flexibility. 
I have a question that's um, it's somewhat, this is my question, it's a little naive, but if I've got a lot of sensors, do I have any problem, and a lot of people in the room with a lot of sensors, do I have a problem distinguishing who's who? Like which center, which center am I talking to and which person? Or do they all have like individual sort of tagging that, that are unique? I'm sorry to be naive about that. No, no, no. This is, this is a very good question. We would have to make sure that the sensors are, uh, are, are, uh, are labeled in a way that uh, we can identify what sensor data is coming from which sensor and also make sure that the, they're synchronized in time. Because if you're looking for some sensor, sensing modality that has very low latency, that needs very quick action, we need to make sure that we understand what time it actually happens. So labeling and time synchronization are some of the challenges that the data people are looking at in, this, in these sensors. Okay. And as far as Good. labeling who the data is coming from, that's also a very interesting question because in some applications, you want to get data from users, but you, you want to make it uh, anonymous because you don't want to right. affect the privacy. And, other, and that would be, the, for example, if you want to look at population health, you want to look at a cohort of individuals and look at their health together and then understand what might be done differently versus a situation where you, what the doctor wants to know your data. So again, the data part of it is, is tremendous here. And I think um, the companies will, are also getting involved in really understanding the privacy issues the security issues and and also the technical issues of how do you how do you make sure the data is accurate? That's a good point. I guess I don't necessarily want the world knowing what my heart rate is. Well, I guess I don't care, right. but right. Sorry. But if there's a if, if if a group of people have suddenly started to develop a fever in a particular oh, yeah. population, then maybe that's a way to help the population not get sick in that particular region if you know what the trends are. So it would. There's a huge opportunity here with population health as well, uh, but that's almost a little bit of a different set of constraints. Oh, it sure is. Them. It sure is. Oh, here's a clarification on the question in the chat window. Instead of having a sensor communicating with a phone, why not build a sensor into the phone and have the phone be the sensor as well as the phone? I suppose that's being thought of as well. Uh, yeah, so basically touch the phone to your body. Yeah, yeah. In other words, why have a sensor? Why not just have it a combination phone sensor? So. Yeah, uh, that and, and indeed that that approach is being taken. There are companies who have built. I think Alive Core is one example where they have built a sensor on the back of the phone where you can put your thumbs right. on and, and it gives you a, a a signal, your pulse rate, your right. heart rate. Um, right. And in some cases, you know, you can use your phone to look at the environmental toxins. And so that up uh, that. That's definitely there, but in certain cases, like if you want a, a ECG signal, a really good quality ECG signal, sometimes you have to get it from the chest. Um, sure. And the phone is not always going to be with you, um, and it's you know it's it's a discrete device you have to carry with your hand. But if something is a part of your body, a part of your garments, and it's seamless, and you don't have to worry about changing the battery, then that opens up some new doors. So um, I think the answer to this person's question is, yeah, I think we can do that when it makes sense. Good, thanks. Uh, we have another question period coming up. Why don't you go ahead and take us forward into your presentation? All right. So uh, let me now go into uh, the next, the third part of my talk, which is I've given you some examples of the kinds of technologies we are building, but I would really like to emphasize that in this center, we don't stop there. We actually integrate these technologies into complete systems and demonstrate the systems as really the output of what we're trying to do. And so uh, in our center, we have developed some what we call test beds. These are our center level systems to really address some of the chronic conditions like asthma, cardiovascular disease, and, and, and um, diabetes uh, uh, as, far about, as far as our applications are concerned. So, here is an example of one of the systems that we have developed. And uh, you can see um, uh, the location on the body where the system would be worn or used. And so this system consists of, uh, let me start with the chest. Uh, we have a chest location. And uh, the idea on the chest would be that you have a microphone to understand wheezing. You have a strain sensor to look at breathing. You have skin impedance uh, that tells you a little bit about the stress of the individual. 
you have ECG on the chest because that's really the best place to get uh, electrocardiogram. You have accelerometer on the chest to understand motion, not only for the sake of understanding the motion, but also to, um, to uh, if there's any noise in the data, we can use the accelerometer to normalize the noise out. And finally, we have pulse oximetry also on the chest to look at the oxygen levels in the blood. Um, and then we have a wrist location. Uh, wrist watches are very popular right now, but wrist is also a great location for environmental sensing uh, because they allow us to access the environment. So this is, for example, volatile organic compounds that are in the environment, ozone in the environment, temperature and humidity that's available in the environment. We can sense all of those. In addition to that, we can also look at motion and uh, oxygen, oxygen levels in the, in, the, in the blood, also on the wrist. So this is what we have. And on the, on the mouth, and this is a, something very specific for asthma, spirometer is a standard device that, uh, um, that uh, doctors use to, uh, to look at people's uh, labored breathing. And so by blowing into the spirometer, they can understand their lung capacity. So we've also looked at that as a part of the entire asthma management system. All right, so um, let me jump into um, what we have done and, and how much room there is to improve when it comes to power consumption, again, with the goal of making these devices always on. And so if you look at, uh, if you build this wristband that I showed you in the previous slide with all of its, its sensors that I listed, the, the power levels that, were, that will be consumed are in the range of 117 milliwatts of power using commercial components only. If you build the same wrist watch, or the wrist band, I should say, wrist band with our, with our technologies, which are really low in power, and I gave you some examples of this, you can see the significant drop in power. We go from 117 milliwatts to 830 microwatts of power. So this is this is now doable and, and manageable in terms of the power that was generated by the body. Let me give you the second example, which is the, the COTS, the chest patch with all its sensors. If you build that using commercial technologies, we get a power consumption of 52 milliwatts, way above anything that we would produce in, in, a, in a body harvesting manner. And instead, if we build it using our technologies, with our um, low power uh, PPG, low power ECG, et cetera, we are now clearly below a milliwatt of power. So in both cases, the wristband and the chest patch, we can break the one milliwatt barrier, go under it, and now we are in the range where we can power these devices using the energy harvesting from the body. And here is what some of these systems look like. And uh, we recently um, published this, and we got quite a bit of press about this. This is our, now our, our, our systems don't look like products because we are a bunch of academic and engineering uh, individuals working on this with our medical partners. But you can see that they are real here and they're functional and they achieve the, the metrics that I have mentioned in the previous slide. So here is a wristband that has, this has the ozone sensors in it along with some other sensors that I talked about. Here is a chest patch. You can see that nanowire based, uh, sorry, nanowire-based uh, multifunctional electrode array here. This is our electronics with the radio in here. And these are the silver nanowire electrodes for ECG. And here is another product that we have been developing in the center, which is our low-power spirometer, again, as a part of the entire asthma management system. And I'd like to now take you to the second video of, of the presentation. And, um, this video, in this video, we have James, who is another student in the center, who is running on the treadmill. That day, he didn't wear his tennis shoes, but he's running on the treadmill, and he has on his body a chest patch that is sending a complete ECG signal to uh, a base station. A base station could be your phone, or in this particular case, it's, it's a laptop. So if you could play the video. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so James has this uh, electrode placed on his chest. You can see that even when the running motion, there is almost no noise that's impacting the R to R interval that he, he, that he measures. Uh, th this is possible only because of the ultra low power electronics that we have built uh, on, this, on the chest patch in this, in this particular example. 
All right, so I'm now at my um, third break to ask uh, the audience if they have any questions about the systems that we're developing for disease management. There is one question that came in by email. Uh, Vina, you mentioned asthma. What about diabetes? It seems there's always been this struggle to get you know, blood glucose and, and things like that, especially through the skin. Are, are there... Um, are there advances in diabetes management? You mentioned asthma, but I was one of the questions came in about diabetes. Yeah, we're also working on diabetes, and the the biggest challenge there is is how do you measure uh, your body's glucose levels non invasively but still accurately? Right. And so that's been the holy grail in this area, and a lot of people have been working on this. Even some products have come out. Um, and in our particular case, we are looking at, uh, at sweat collection. So if we can collect the sweat non-invasively, and we have technologies that can collect sweat even when you think you're not sweating. And that's because you, even sitting in normally in a room, you are generating some sweat, but it's very, very low in, in, in the amount of sweat. So we have technologies that use osmotic pressures to collect even that small amount of sweat. So the challenge there is really to, there are two challenges. One is to collect small amounts of fluid and extract the, what you're looking for in there, which is glucose. And second, is sweat glucose reliable measure of the body's diabetic state? And that is an unanswered question right now, and, and we are looking into working with people uh, on answering that. Interesting approach. I know, like you are saying, this holy grail, right? 20 years ago, there was people looking at all these optical through the skin near infrared methods of looking at at uh, blood glucose but this idea of capturing something that's normally there at a very low level that's a pretty interesting approach yeah and and and, and i think if we, if we can even if the, the correlation is not exactly one to one if you can understand and use this as a way to un, to develop trends so if you if you're a pre-diabetic or if you just want to understand what your sugar level is doing in response to all your habits, this could be a great way to get there. So this is a very good opportunity, a new area for, for individuals who want to get in. This, this is exciting space. And of course, it's not just glucose. You can start thinking about other things you want to detect. For example, maybe you can detect your immune response if you're developing an infection. You don't quite feel the symptoms. But if something can show up in sweat, they can tell you, hey, you're going to get an infection. Take care of yourself. There are some other very huge opportunities here. It's, it is impressive. Um, why don't you go ahead and take us into the things that you'd like to tell us about the educational mission of your center. Yeah, sounds good. And I know I'm running against the clock here. So, um, so the other big piece of all this is education. And we are developing technologies, but we're also developing and growing the next generation of innovators and entrepreneurs in the center. We are spread out over six universities. We have about 30 faculty members, but we are also directly working with over 90 graduate students, over 120 undergraduate students, and thousands of students in the pre-college uh, and the K through 12 arena, including community colleges as well. Here are some examples of what we're doing. We are, we are impacting, and I'll be happy to share the details with anybody who's interested. We want to be able to send these, uh, our, uh, our findings out to people who want to try them and give us feedback. We have been working on curriculum development in this space, improving knowledge skills that they don't get inside the curriculum. We're engaging undergraduates in all kinds of research experiences, not just REU, but even bringing them on uh, during this academic year, involving them in senior design projects, and we are doing uh, different kinds of dissemination of our research to the K-12 through communities. Um, here are two specific examples. Uh, we had recently a student from a community college, one of the biggest ones in this area, which is called Wake Tech Community College. He came and became part of our senior of our uh, summer REU program, and then from there he transferred to NC State and is going to be a graduate student in the thermoelectric arena. On the right here are a couple of our graduate students. Uh, they represented our center at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show, which is of course, a very big show in Las Vegas. And basically, we were able to show the electronics community some of the advances we are making in this space. 
uh, as uh, just some uh, nuggets of our, of our education program, we are looking at um, uh, communication, academic programs, targeting the outreach, unique research experiences, the skills program, which we call translational uh, an engineering skills uh, program. We're publishing about several of these. We published last year at the ASE conference, and we're also publishing some of our findings this year. And we also assess all of our, all of our educational programs. It turns out that wearables are a great educational tool. It, it, no matter what the age of the student is, they really resonate with the idea of having a wearable device that monitors your health. And what's really impressive is these six graders on the, on the bottom here that have built completely functional wearable devices while in sixth grade. Of course, these are built using commercial components and a little bit of help from our team, but yet these these kids can see the impact of building systems and then testing these systems out. And so we have this program where we're reaching out to, to uh, middle schoolers and high school students across the state of North Carolina, but we would like to expand that, and that is a One Health challenge. And if you're interested in this, I can, I can certainly get you connected to the right individuals here. Uh, we're also working with companies, and I'll get to that also in a minute, to really look at data. Uh, let me leave it at that here because I'll come to that. And, and, and just a few months ago, we were invited to give a, a TEDx talk. I, from what I have been told, this talk will be made publicly available in just a couple of days. So if you search for my name um, in TEDx, you should be able to find the talk uh, that is on self-powered. Uh, it's called Powering Your Wellness, um, uh, and it's, it's all about these kinds of technologies. All right, and my um, last slide before I conclude is the third piece. So we have the research piece, we have the education piece. The third piece, which is essential here, is the industry piece. And the industry members really are critical in, in taking our technologies from the lab and make, converting them to commercializable products. Uh, if you are a company in the audience, then um, uh, you might uh, find some value in being an industry member. Uh, we have several members here who engage with us uh, in many ways. One way is they, they work with our students as student internships. Another way is they work with developing our systems. Um, and uh, other ways are sponsoring projects and so forth. So I think this is a huge opportunity. Okay, so I'd like to finish now. Um, I hope I've been able to show you that with self-powered wearable technologies, we hope to manage wellness, but, in, but do so in a non-invasive and comfortable manner. By having these devices that don't require charging of batteries, we can establish long-term health trends which simply do not exist today. So this would be a huge uh, improvement in, in understanding an individual's health. We can even look at this data and predict onset of life-threatening conditions like strokes or, or heart attacks. The opportunity is there. With the educational programs, we are creating a pipeline of future innovators and leaders. And with our industry members hand in hand with us, we are also hoping to stimulate the economy with, our, with some of our technologies. So um, with that, I'll, I thank you for your time, and I'd be open for more questions if there, if there is time, Mike. I'm not sure what the... I do. We do have a, a few moments for questions. Veena, I wanted to thank you very much for, for this really engaging presentation. I do uh, want to make a short announcement from our sponsors, and then we'll go into our final question uh, period. At Penn State University, there's a new initiative called the Remotely Accessible Instruments for Nanotechnology. And we wanted to generate some awareness about this. It engages and enables instructors to really connect to high quality nano instrumentation from your classroom. So that's my little pitch for that. Today, we've heard a great deal about wearables and their nanotechnology components. I do have one question about the nanotechnology. And, and Veen, I'm now going, before we go into those questions, I'm now going to launch our survey. And participants, you'll see this come up on the screen. And if it doesn't come up on your screen, you can click on the Browse To feature that comes up on your own thing. But most of you will be seeing the uh, the survey right now. It's just a few questions, so please respond. Help us get better. Veena, as our final question, it has to do with the nanotechnology. You mentioned using silver nanowires for hydration. 
How does that work? Is that an, an inferred from skin uh, compliance or something, or is there actually some measure of of hydration there? That was a, a curious one. Yeah. So um, I didn't get into a lot of the details of the nanotechnology, the way, the different ways we're using it. So one example is silver nanowires. I'll get to that in a minute. I also talked about our thermoelectric materials have bismuth telluride nanocomposites. And there are a few more examples. So let me now answer your question. The silver nanowires are actually embedded in a polymer uh, matrix. And by having the silver nanowires in this matrix, the polymer becomes, this matrix becomes conductive. But at the same time, it's also stretchable. And so it allows us to make this very comfortable, compatible uh, electrode for the skin. The hydration is actually done using an electrical measurement. It's done using an impedance measurement. So that measurement is a standard technique. But using our, our silver nanowire embedded PDMS matrices, we can get a very good contact to the skin and make a robust impedance measurement, which then allows us to measure hydration levels. The, hyd the impedance between, of, of the skin changes uh, with, depending on when somebody is hydrated or dehydrated. And if you change the electrode spacing or you change the frequency of operation, you can either get closer to the surface or you can even go further in the skin and measure the hydration levels at different points. Okay, so I see. It's, I hadn't really thought about the impedance side. Of course, it makes sense from what you're saying. Hmm. Perfect. Yes, it's based, uh, silver nanowires allow us to basically make a very good quality electrode. I have one last comment on my side. You know, I've done some testing of some com some commercial off-the-shelf sensors, and your comment about the uh, the variability in the data that streams from them is really true. I mean, I was just watching some temperature measurements, and there was lags and and miscorrelations and. It's just not totally there yet, but I, I thought that was an interesting comment that you made. That's one of the challenges in the sensor world today. Yeah, I think in general, some of these wearable devices, you know, in, this, in the area of sleep and, and fitness, some people report up to 20, 25% error. Yeah. So it'll be, it's a definitely a challenge, and we have to we have to address that. You know, as a final thing, I think to me one of the things that resonated the most with your presentation was the movement from managing illness to managing wellness. And I think that's just a, it's a sea change when you think about things like that. Exactly. And I think by, if you have a technology that is seamless, right, and it doesn't, you don't have to do anything about it, it becomes part of your, the shirt that you wear every day. And you really start getting all this very interesting data about your body you can really now start moving in that direction. And um, this is the, the power of some of these technologies. And there's a lot of work going on uh, all over the world to try to understand this. We are by no means the only group that's looking at it. But we are focused on really making these self-powered. That's a perfect way to, to close our webinar today. Dr. Misra, that officially ends our webinar. Thank you again for our presentation. Colleagues online, thanks for joining. And as a reminder, this webinar has been recorded, and as a result of your registration, you will get a link to the recording and to the slides themselves. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Mizor. It's a real pleasure working with you and listening to the presentation today. Thank you very much again, and thanks for the opportunity. And thanks to all of the participants who joined in, in hearing this. Appreciate your interest. Goodbye, everyone. That officially ends our webinar, and we're signing off on our audio channel now. Thank you.